Praise the Lord and good evening to everyone under the sound of my voice who have joined us this evening for uh, this Tuesday evening Bible class. We welcome you to Mount Calvary Pentecostal Church in the city of Youngstown, Ohio, the city of God, where there we anticipate and expect a tremendous move of the Lord. It is a privilege and an honor to come to you this evening and to share with you in the rich, eternal word of God. I'm Elder Craig Gilchrist, your speaker for the evening. I wanted to first give honor to God, who is, of course, the head of our life, and the sustainer and the lifter of our head. I want to also give honor to our pastor, the angel of this house, and our First Lady in the person of Suffragan Bishop C. Sean Tyson and First Lady Krista Tyson. I want to say thank you to them for extending this opportunity to us to share with you, the people of God, in this august word at such a critical and crucial time. Indeed, we are privileged of God. And God has given us an assignment we're not going to belabor the point, but we're going to get right into the Word of God. We do solicit your prayers. We're going to ask you to turn with us this evening to the book of 2 Chronicles, the sixth chapter. And we're going to revisit uh, the specific text that was given to us on this past Sunday, just to share a little further in the Word of God from that particular passage of scripture. Second Corinthians, the sixth chapter, and we shall begin reading at verse number 35. Verse number 34. If thy people go out to war against their enemy, by the way that thou shalt send them, and they pray unto thee toward this city, which thou hast chosen, and the house which I have built for thy name. Then hear thou from heaven their prayer and their supplication and maintain their cause. If they sin against thee, for there is no man which sinneth not, and thou be angry with them, and deliver them over before their enemy, and they carry them away captive unto a land far off or near, yet if they bethink themselves in the land whither they are carried captive and turn and pray unto thee in the land of their captivity, saying, We have sinned, we have done amiss, and have dealt wickedly. If they return. Verse number 38, the key and central verse of our lesson tonight. If they return to thee with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their captivity, whether they have carried them captive and pray toward their land, which thou gavest them unto their father and toward the city which thou hast chosen and toward the house which I have built for thy name. Then hear thou from heaven, even from thy dwelling place, their prayer and their supplication and maintain their cause and forgive thy people which have sinned against thee. 
And all the people of God said, Amen. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is indeed and again a privilege of ours to be able to come before this, the throne of grace. We bow before thee, Lord God, in thanksgiving, in praise, and in worship. Despite, Lord, that which is going on around us, we declare, Lord, that thou art a worthy God deserving of all praise. Now, God, in the name of Jesus, let not thy servant do thy word any harm. Cause us, Lord God, to speak reason to rhyme and truth to fact. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Sunday, the man of God spoke to us and he utilized for a subject, if they return to me. Tonight, we want to continue that and leave with you a subtopic, repent to return. Repent to return. There is in the atmosphere, hovering over the house of God throughout the nation and throughout the world, a word that is clamoring for the attention of the people of God. There is a word that is thunderously sounding to the people of God who would be saved and rapture ready. That word is repent. That word repent comes to the people of God in this critical and crucial season. It is a key word that many today do not enjoy dealing with because it would seemingly highlight that we are not where we should be. When the man or woman of God stands before the people of God and they begin to share with them that you need to repent. Immediately our defenses go up and our minds begin to fight that very thought. But hear me real good, people of God. I stand here tonight before you as the end time minister that God has called and ordained me to be to send to you a word that God himself is calling forth from heaven to his people whom he has elected and selected to save and deliver. And that word again I say to you that is hovering strongly in the atmosphere over the kingdom of men and the kingdom of God is repent. Happens to be one of the first principles of the apostolic doctrine where the Bible declares to us in the book of Hebrews, it's sixth chapter and verses one through three, but there it opens to us and therefore leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance, first apostolic principle, that in any apostolic, any true apostolic believes 
is that we must repent from dead works. Where are we today? We are where the church has come through a critical and a crucial time. We are here in an unprecedented time, a time where we are observing things that were unimaginable to our humanity to consider happening to the church of the living God. Never in the history or the course of man have we ever seen a day such as we are observing today. A day and a time wherein the world itself has been turned upside down because of a coronavirus pandemic. And this coronavirus pandemic has had a uh, uncalculable uh, effect upon the world in multiple ways and fashions, wherein to this point we have lost in the United States over 213,000 souls, as the news would report. Our country is in financial dilemma. We're in racial unrest, unprecedented time. We're in a time where, during this time of the year, where we are about to vote for our next president of the United States, a critically crucial time that will not only affect the people of God, it will affect the United States destiny and it will affect the destiny of the world. A critically crucial time. And how the church fares through this period will determine what will the outcome be of not only the church, but that of the United States and that of the world. I tell you, people of God, that we are in a critical time. And God, my friend, is not only calling for your return, but today's message and lesson to you is that you must repent to return. Hallelujah to God. We have come down to this unprecedented time, a time where we are facing in our world and in our society, a time where the Bible, the word of God, is being fulfilled before our very eyes. You ask why are there so many calamities going on? Well, we have come to arrive at the end time. We are where Jesus began to tell his disciples in the 24th chapter of the book of St. Matthews of those characteristics that would uh, mark uh, the end time uh, that we are in. And he comes on the scene and says to us uh, uh, that there would be a time where we would hear of wars and rumors of wars. And he goes on to characterize the time uh, that we are living in. He says, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and, and you shall be hated of nations and then shall many be offended. I have never seen a church age where so many of the saints of God 
are wearing their feelings on their shoulders. It does not matter how sensitive or how minute a person can be in sharing some type of criticism. Immediately, the saints of the Most High get offended and want to name that church as being a unfriendly church or a mean church because somebody said something that was off color to them. Well, the scriptures comes to share that with us. He says that there would be many false prophets that would rise and uh, deceive many. He says, uh, and uh, he says that, but they that shall endure unto the end, uh, the same shall be saved. Uh, we're living in a day and a time where the gospel has been watered down. Uh, we have come to realize uh, that our fathers who met, ministered uh, a message to us that was definite, uh, straight down the line, uh, a message that made a distinction uh, between right and wrong uh, and between that which was holy and that which was unholy. Uh, we have come to a day and a time where our ministry is compromising in its delivery of the word of God. Compromising to the extent that we are not making plain and distinct the lesson that God has not changed his mind on. And that is that you, my friend, my brothers and my sisters, have been called to holiness. Glory to God. You have been called to righteousness. You have been called out from among them to be ye separate, saith the Lord. Hallelujah to God. But what has happened to us is that this coronavirus has exemplified or manifest a character that was latent in the people of God. Again, an unprecedented time. We never thought that we would ever see a day where the church of the living God, the doors to the church would be shut down. But Corona came on the scene. Now, I personally believe that God was trying to get the people of God's attention for a few reasons. But what I would highlight to you is that we saw that during this time that the church was shut down, that men and women began to act out of character. Glory to God. They began to act out of the character that we would see on a weekly basis when the doors of the church was open because they shut down the doors of the church. Many stopped coming to church that classified themselves as being saved. And they began to act out of the character that is uh, distinctive to a walk uh, that God has ordained for the people that name the name of Christ. And so, my friend, they forgot 
that while we did not see you on a human basis with our human eyes, they forgot there is an all-seeing God. Hallelujah, that the Bible said in 2 Corinthians, it's 16th chapter, and it's 9th verse, that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. They forgot that while you may not have been in my presence or in the presence of any of the other saints of the Most High, that God's eyes are on those that he loves. And because God has put his eyes on you, my friend, his eyes went wherever you went. When you went into the bar and got you a little taste, God's eyes went with you. When you went down the street to Sally's house, hallelujah to God, to get your thing on, your groove on, God's eyes went with you. When, my friend, you picked up a little bud light or you picked up a little bud, God's eyes were on you. And the challenge is that God, my friend, has said, don't they know that I'm watching everything that they're doing? Don't they know uh, that if they've been baptized uh, in my name, uh, that they're taking my name uh, into the cesspool of sin? Uh, don't they know uh, that if they don't get right uh, before I come, uh, that my judgment will be against them uh, and in hell uh, they'll lift up their eyes. Uh, Oh, friend, hear me real good. The Bible is distinct and declares to us when you think you're getting away, the psalmist comes on the scene and the psalmist begins to tell us. He says to us in the 139th division of Psalms, he says, where is there that I can go from your presence? He says, whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from, the pre from thy presence? He's talking to God. The psalmist is saying, he says, if I ascend up into heaven, Thou art there, and if I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Hear God real good. He is omnipresent. He is wherever he designs and purposes to be at all time and all space. He says, even there, he says, if I take the wings of the morning and shall dwell in the uttermost parts of the, of the sea, even there shall thine hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness, glory to God, and here it is, Surely the darkness shall cover me. Even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness and the light, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both a light to thee. So when you thought you were getting away, 
God said, I saw you in the midnight. Glory to God. And for the saint of God who has been praying and asking God to move in their behalf in their midnight hour, God is saying, I saw you in the night and I heard your cry and I am here to honor your plea. Glory to God. Who am I talking to today? I want you to know that the night is like the day unto God. There is no place that you can hide from God. Now, let me get into this text. Where are we in this text? Well, in the text, the text brings us now into a dedicatorial service. I need you to go now into your imagination with me and consider it like this, that you are now about to attend the dedication of your newly erected sanctuary. You are now about to have that grand celebration of the newly established and newly built sanctuary that God has ordained for you to erect in his name. And where we are is that King Solomon is now offering up prayers of dedication to God in the midst of this dedicatorial service. And he begins to pray a litany of prayers that would deal with a multiplicity of characteristics and conditions that would face the people of God as they transverse through this world that we are pilgrimaging through. You understand what I'm saying? Through this world that we are traveling through on our way to our eternal destiny, he begins to lift up before God a number of prayers. And the Bible said in the fifth chapter of 2 Chronicles, thus all the work that Solomon made for the house of the Lord was finished. Remember, we think of it like this. Think now that this Sunday coming, we're coming to church to have the dedication service for the new sanctuary that has gone through its rebuilding and remodeling. Now all of the saints are excited about what to take place. You know what we go through? We develop programs of that which we are going to present to God as we dedicate and sanctify the sanctuary to God. And the man of God stands before the people after the work was done and begins a litany in prayer. And he begins to say, Then said Solomon, The Lord hath said that he would dwell in the thick darkness. But I have built a house of habitation for thee and a place for thy dwelling forever. And the king turned his face and blessed the whole congregation. Think of it like this. Your pastor has stood to give his uh, homily to the people of God of what is about to take place. 
And what your pastor does is he lifts up his hands over the people of God as not only in this instance the king of the people, but now in this instance the priest of the people to bless them for what God is about to do before their very eyes. And so he says, but God has chosen this place, Jerusalem, that my name might be there. Well, I can tell you, Calvary, God has chosen this place that his name might be here. And God is saying to the people of God, now it was in the heart of David, my father, to build a house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. But the Lord said to David, my father, for as much as it was in thine heart to build, God is telling David, you, though you are a man after my heart, and though I have given you the vision for the house, you will not be the man to build the house. Your son will stand in your stead and speak in your behalf to complete the work that I have given you the vision and the finance to do. Glory to God. Pastor, hear me real good. The the money is already in place for you to complete the ministry assignment that God has ordained for your life to complete both here and there. Hallelujah. Come on and glorify his name. And so he goes on to give now a litany of prayers. He says, now then, verse number 17, O Lord God of Israel, let thy word be verified which thou hast spoken unto thy servant David. But will God in very deed dwell with men on the earth? Be, be, behold, heaven and the heavens of heaven cannot contain him. Hallelujah to God. While we have erected this place, as a habitation of God, it does not limit God to dwelling in this place within these four walls. Because, remember, we're in the Old Testament. The Holy Ghost had not come yet that would not just abide within four walls, but would abide in you. Because now, my friend, according to the Apostle Paul, you are the temple of the Holy Ghost in whom the Spirit of God dwells. So then, God is not on the outside, he is on the inside, going with you wherever you go. And so he goes on to say, then hear that, he goes on to make plea. He says, if there be dearth in the land, if there be pestilence, if there be blastings, or mildew, or locusts, 
or caterpillar. If their enemies besieged them in the city of their land, whatsoever sore or whatsoever sickness there be, then what prayer or what supplication soever shall be made of any man or of all thy people, Israel, when every one shall know his own sore and his own grief and shall spread forth his hand in this house, he says in his prayer, then hear thou from heaven thy dwelling place and forgive and render unto every man according unto all his ways whose heart thou knowest for thou only knowest the heart of the children of men. Glory to God. He is saying to you uh, that while we may not be able uh, to discern uh, your heart, uh, he identifies uh, that God is able uh, to discern your heart. Uh, and this COVID uh, has brought out uh, of your heart uh, those hidden things uh, that you would not Speak to us those hidden things that you would not release, those hidden things that you would not let go of. I got to move on here, but I'm trying to get you to understand that God is calling for you to repent, to return. And so he says uh, in this litany of prayer in the sixth chapter, he goes on in our lesson here that verse number 36, uh, if they sin against thee, uh, if they, uh, for there is no man that does not sin, uh, and thou be angry with them, uh, and deliver them over before their enemy, and they carry them away captive unto a land far off or near. Yet if they bethink themselves in the land whither they are carried captive, he says, and turn and pray unto thee, all you've got to do is turn. God, my friend, is waiting to be gracious. You don't have to die where you are. You don't have to allow one mistake or one indiscretion to define the balance of your life. Because he has prayed here, if they will turn, if they will turn and pray unto thee in the land of their captivity and his repentance, you must declare we have sinned, we have done amiss, and we have dealt wickedly. He says, if they return to thee, he wants to know God, if they return with all their soul in the land of their captivity, whether they have carried them captive and pray toward their land. If you can just get to the house of God, Fall prostrate on your face before God. Cry out unto him, letting him know that you have made a grave error and that you are sorry for 
the disgrace that you have brought upon the name of the Lord and the house of God and the people of God because you understand that we are living in rapture season and momentarily God could crack the sky and catch us all away and friend if you don't take the opportunity tonight to get your life together you will be left here to go through a most unimaginable time in the history of the world and in the history of the church. Oh, clap your hands, somebody, and tell God thank you for the opportunity to get right again. Come on and give God a praise. Hallelujah to God. And so he says, he says, then hear thou from heaven. Now, all of these prayers culminate in that very famous passage of scripture in the seventh chapter of Second Chronicles, where there the Bible says that God came to Solomon in the night season. And the Bible says that the Bible says that God says to Solomon that he has a, he appears to God, to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and I have chosen this place. Hear me, saints of the Most High, the salvation and the deliverance is not in a person, but it's in the place. God said, I've chosen this place. I've chosen this place for my name to dwell. And I've chosen this people for myself. Hallelujah to God. And he says those famous words. If I shut up heaven, that there be no rain. <laughs> Glory to God. He says, if I shut up heaven, that there be no rain. And I'm coming to a close now. If I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people, here it is, that very famous verse that all of us have been quoting through this time of the COVID-19. Well, here is the result of the sacrificial prayer and offering that the man of God was offering for the people of God. God said, I heard your prayer. And if I do this unto them, if my people, which are called by my name, would humble themselves and pray, if they would seek my face, and turn, here it is, you've got to repent to return. If they will turn from their wicked ways. Now isn't it interesting that God knows your wickedness? Isn't it interesting that your wickedness has not caught God off guard or taken him by surprise. Isn't it interesting that despite how ugly you have been, God said, if you will turn from your wicked way, 
he said, then will I hear from heaven. I'll hear your cry. I'll honor your plea. I'll give you and acknowledge your supplication. And I will not only hear, but I will forgive your sins. Oh, that ought to get some praise out of somebody. To be forgiven by God and man. He says, I'll forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Well, as I bring this to a close, I am recalling a New Testament passage of scripture where the Bible gives us an example of this. As I bring this to a close, the example is found in the book of the 15th chapter of St. Luke, beginning at the 11th verse, where there the Bible describes that there was a certain man that had two sons. He had two sons that he loved very dearly. And this one son, one of two, came to his father and said to him, give me what's mine, hallelujah to God, so I can go my way. Now, there's a number of stories inherent in that, but time will not permit me. Suffice it to say, his father gives him his inheritance. And the story goes on to tell us that he got out into the world and he lost everything that he had on riotous living, only to end up working as a slave in a pigsty. Glory to God. As I bring this to a close, he worked for a man who told him to go down and feed the pigs. Hallelujah to God. And this is where many of you will end up if you don't hear and heed this word that is coming to you tonight. You will end up in a pigsty. The Bible said that this man came to himself and he began to say that my father's servants are doing better than I am here right now. I'll get up from this place and I'll go home. I will return. Glory to God. But I'm going to repent to return. I will fix my face and my speech to declare to my father that I have sinned miserably. And I will ask him not to restore me back to my former place, but just let me come in as one of his servants. But the love of God, hallelujah to God. Let us, the love of God, the songwriter said, is greater far than tongue or pen can tell. It reaches to the highest mountain and it goes down to the lowest hell. The love of God, when God has set his affection on you, because God is unchangeable. He will not withdraw his love from you. He will withdraw his presence from you, but not his love. Because until you repent, 
to return, God must stay separated from you because the holiness of God cannot have anything to do with the filthiness of man. But God will give you a chance to repent so that you can return. Come on, somebody, and give him a praise. He's worthy. Now, that is not the conclusion. Glory to God. When he got home, the Bible said that his father saw him from afar off. His father from a distance saw his son returning home. And the father didn't act like he was going to be reserved and be confined and dignified. He ran to his son to embrace him and to love him back into the fold so that he could return to his place and his position. God is waiting for you. God is anxious for you uh, to turn unto him uh, and be saved, uh, be delivered, uh, and be set free. Uh, let God uh, heal you. Uh, let God uh, deliver you. Uh, let God uh, raise you uh, and let him uh, save you. Uh, oh, come on and give him some praise. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we do thank you, Father, for this word that you have shared with us tonight. Father, we pray that if there have been any offenses that we have committed against thee, Lord, we come before thee cautiously and consciously to declare, Father, that we're sorry. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. We're sorry. We're sorry, Lord. We're sorry. Father, we repent. We change our mind. We see things the way you see them. We ask, Father, in the Nebadushe, Kiavasa, oh Jesus, that you would have mercy on us. Father, we cannot be guilty because, Lord, there is no man who can stand up under the judgment of God. But it has already been declared, if thou should mock iniquity, where, Lord God, can we stand? Father, we cannot plead innocent because of a truth we know we're not innocent. So, Lord, what we do plead is the blood of Jesus. <laughs> Oh, Jesus, we plead the blood. We plead the cleansing power of the blood of the Lamb of God. Let your blood wash. Let your blood cleanse. Let your blood purge, sanctify, and make whole. And we will give you praise. We will give you the glory. We will give you all the honor in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace is our prayer. Repent to return. God will receive you take you back into the fold, wash away all of your sin through the name of Jesus 
and the authority that's in the blood of the Lamb of God. Be blessed, be renewed, be restored in Jesus' name.